Pastor Tyler was talking about being in New York. He's married to a Texas girl, and Texas girls are feisty. <laughs> How many know that to be true? I'm married to one. They're, they are feisty women, and the older they get, just like they get better with age. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and remind me of the story about this mature Texas lady. She got pulled over one day for speeding. As the officer was approaching, he, she rolled down her window and she said, Is there a problem, officer? Trooper said, Ma'am, you were speeding. She said, Oh, I see. Trooper said, Can I see your license, please? Texas woman said, I'd give it to you, but I don't have one. Trooper said, You don't have one? Texas woman responds, lost it four years ago for drunk driving. <laughs> Trooper says, well, I, I see. Can I see your vehicle registration papers, please? Woman says, I, I can't do that either. Trooper says, why not? Texas woman says, well, I stole this car. <laughs> stole the car? Texas woman says, yes, and I killed and hacked up its owner. <laughs> you, you, you what? Trooper said, woman said, his body parts are in plastic bags in the trunk if you want to see. Trooper looks at the woman, slowly backs away to his car, calls for backup. Within five minutes, six police cars surround the car. The trooper sergeant slowly approaches the car, clasping his half-drawn gun. Sergeant says, ma'am, could you step out of your vehicle, please? The woman steps out of her vehicle. Texas woman says, is there a problem, sir? Sergeant says, one of my officers told me you have stolen this car and murdered the owner. Texas woman said, murdered the owner? Sergeant says, yes. Would you please pop the trunk of your car? She does. The woman opens the trunk revealing nothing but an empty trunk. Sergeant says, is this your car, ma'am? Texas woman said, yes. Here are the registration papers. <laughs> Sergeant is stunned at this point. Well, one of my officers right here says that you don't have a driver's license. The woman digs into her handbag, pulls out her clutch purse, and hands it to the officer. Now the sergeant's looking at her really puzzled. Well, thank you, ma'am. One of my officers told me you didn't have a license, you stole this car, and you had murdered and hacked up the owner. Texas woman responds, bet that liar told you I was speeding too. <laughs> I don't, I, you don't try that. <laughs> this morning, I'm wrapping up series part five, Influenced or Influencer. We live in a world where it's all too easy to be the influenced. Somebody has an idea, an opinion, a thought that identifies with your identity or your ideas and opinions and the next thing you know you're off track. The most difficult thing about the Christian life is staying on course. How many know that to be true? It's the most difficult thing that we do in life. You know why? Because there are seasons when you have great passion and fire and it's really hot and there are seasons when it's not. There are seasons when everything that you believe about God is tested. How many know that's true? There are seasons when you are tired and weary and you just want to give in and give up. There are seasons when it's much easier to follow everyone else than it is to follow Christ. But the one thing I know about influencers, influencers stay the course. Now, let me give you kind of the precursor to this morning's message. I, I'm not an evangelist. Uh, I'm not a missionary, thank God. I'm here in Texas, amen. Anything outside of Texas is the mission field for me. So when you say go to New York, you might as well say go, go any place. It's mission field for me. Uh, and, and so I'm thankful to be a pastor. And this morning's message is a pastoral sermon. 
Uh, and what that means is today I'm going to try to encourage you and teach you and tell you the way that you can stay on course. Now I've had lots of great examples along the way. Uh, Shelley's dad was a great man of God. I mean an incredible man of God. My dad who passed away about four weeks ago was a great man of God. Uh, and these are men I know that set the pattern and they stayed the course. No matter what came their way, they always stayed the course. And so I thought about their lives in preparation for this, but I also came across the words of the Apostle Paul that I think are going to be interesting and helpful to us today. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse number 12. Dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard. Everybody say work hard. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I like this scripture because I like what the Apostle Paul does here. He gives us an order. But it's not just an order of human effort. It's an order of faith. Because we read these words, work hard, uh, and we're fooled by that expression thinking that working hard is not an expression of faith. Uh, some people think that Christianity shouldn't be hard, should it? Uh, and we all know this, and you've already thought this, we are not saved by our hard works, so why should we work? Well, I'm going to be very facetious here when I say this. I love cherry-picking preachers and theologians. Because you understand that we have this particular passage and there would be some that would come and say, well, the Christian life doesn't require work at all, but that's not what this says. Later on, just a few, few verses down, you're going to find the Apostle Paul talking about our salvation. Philippians 3.8, he says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And so you say, Pastor, I'm confused. Was the Apostle Paul uh, confused? He was not. I want us to understand that everybody gets the picture by what Jesus did on the cross uh, and he was resurrected on the third day that we have salvation. Somebody say amen. amen. That he provides for us salvation and we understand that it came at a very high price that if anybody ever tells you that it's free, it is never free. Salvation has never been free. It cost Jesus everything he had. Salvation is not free. But on the other hand, we have the, the Apostle Paul saying also work hard to prove the results of your salvation. Which is right. Well, I'm going to tell you which is right. Both are right. That it is by faith that we believe in Jesus Christ and we attain to his righteousness. But you understand something. It is also through faith and by faith that we have relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something about relationships. Relationships are work. Every married person here should have said amen when I said that. Let me try that again. Relationships are work. Amen. And you say, well, I didn't, wouldn't think our relationship with God would be work. Hold on just a second. We were born into sin. Everybody say born into sin. Born into sin. Uh, and we have been redeemed in our spirit, man. But how many of you know we still have temptation? Yeah. How many of you know we still fail? How many know that there's still one that steals, kills, and destroys, and that he comes against us all the time? How many know all those things are true? And so now we have all these difficulties pertaining our relationship with God. God doesn't have a problem. We do. Somebody say amen. I, we've got all these things stacked against us. That yes, he has provided a way of salvation. And we can come and pray that prayer today and say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and guess what he does? But if you don't tend to this other part of the equation, you're going to be the same person you were on the day you were saved, and you're going to struggle with the same stuff you struggled with before you got saved, and you're going to struggle with that for the rest of your life. See, 
righteousness is attained by faith through Christ. Relationship is maintained by faith through the expression of hard work. And the one thing I know is this. Influencers know that the Christian life is hard work. And we live in a world where we say, well, give me something easier. But I'm going to tell you something, and I encourage you to do so. I shared it on Wednesday night. Philippians chapter 2, it says, you should have the same attitude as Christ, who came as God. Can you imagine? He came as God and humbled himself and became man. That he talks about these two expressions in Christ's life of of what we know to be true, humility and selflessness. And he says, this same attitude ought to exist in you. Can I tell you something today? That doesn't just happen. Come on now. I'm not trying to burst your bubble because we're Americans and we are so gullible. We think that if we can buy a pill and lose 40 pounds. <laughs> if I had one today to sell you, I could be a millionaire before we left this place today. Uh, we believe that it ought to be easy and it ought to come easy uh, and it ought to be made easy. But I want you to understand something. There was no, nothing easy about Jesus going to the cross. In fact, he said in Gethsemane, Lord, if it's possible, this cup may be taken from me. You know what he was saying? This is going to be really, really, really hard. And there are things in our Christian life that sometimes are really, really hard. And sometimes it requires really, really hard work. And so we have to understand that there is nothing that's easier because you understand something to attain to where you need. There is no poof and all of a sudden you're a mature Christian. There is no Christian osmosis where if you hang out at church long enough, all of a sudden you become a mature Christian. That doesn't happen. There are things that come through our testing, our trial, and our hard work that makes us mature. So we, we desire for the nature of Christ to be seen in our life. And that nature is the practice. Everybody say practice because that's important. The practice of selflessness and humility. See, when people quit serving God and just begin serving themselves again, it's the beginning of the change of course. How do you keep the course? How do you stay the course? Well, what happens to those people it's people who change the course and all of a sudden they're just viewing themselves and they view the gospel through their lens of selfishness. They become spectators. Now I want us to understand something. Spectators are not participants. Somebody say amen. You purchase a ticket, you go to the event, you watch the event, and you leave. You may feel good about it. You may feel bad about it. But I want to tell you something. You had no investment in the event other than buying a ticket. You, you had no hard work in, in the outcome of that game than anybody else there. Somebody say amen. amen. This year, my son Jonathan, he's 13 and he's in junior high. And he played junior high basketball. It was as much torture as having my fingernails tore out because you understand something about junior high seventh grade basketball the basketball is bad the referees are bad the fans are bad everything is bad but I'm going to tell you something I was a spectator and what that meant was I could sit in the stands and I could holler at the refs and holler at my son maybe occasionally holler at the coach but when it's all said and done, I walked out of there and I had no say-so in the outcome of anything. Now, you understand something? I grew up playing basketball. I played basketball in college. Uh, but I'm going to tell you this. I have no desire to put on my shorts and lace up my shoes and run sprints. I have no desire to go out and shoot any shots. I, you know, my, sometimes I'm out in the, in the driveway in front of the house and I'll go shoot a few shots with the kids and that's the extent of my basketball these days. I have, you say, Pastor, don't you want to get in shape to play basketball? Not at all. <laughs> don't want to do it. Do you know why? I'd rather be a spectator. When it comes to Christian life, there are a lot of people that would rather be a spectator. But you understand something. Christianity is not a spectator sport. The kingdom of God was not created for spectators. 
The kingdom of God was created for participants. Nowhere are you going to find in scripture where it says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son for spectators. There's a kingdom. It's a real kingdom. It exists today. We're in that kingdom today. Somebody say amen. God didn't create you to be a spectator. Spectators aren't in the game. And so we understand this development process is so important because there's an old nature that fights against us. And that old nature says, this is what I want. We fight it from the very beginning. You, you know, I saw just a few minutes ago. Uh, let's see, Jeremy took out the baby a few minutes ago. Uh, do you know why? How, how old is the youngest now, Jenna? Five months. Five months. Cute as can be. Jenna's baby. She's five months old cute little baby but you understand about the one thing about babies they want what they want when they want it so you know what they do they don't care if they're in church they're going to scream you know why because they want what they want they don't care if I'm in the middle of a sermon you know why because they want what they want that's what babies do that, that, that's a part of the sin nature that says here's this selfishness I want what I want and you would think as Christians we eventually outgrow that Somebody say amen. But that's how we get off the course so quickly is that we forget that we're called to have the same attitude as Christ. Selflessness and humility and both of those things are practices. You understand what that means? Practice means work. Somebody say amen. amen. Can I tell you something? If you don't practice selflessness and humility, you won't come to church on Sunday and have it. You're going to say, ah, who, who would want to work in the nursery? I don't want to work in the nursery. That's no fun. Who wants to work with the kids? They're, they're a pain in the butt. And I realized how important this process was. And as I read the word of God, I realized it even more. Because the apostle Paul worked, writes to the church in Thessalonica and he had some problems there. But he was there long enough because he wanted to see that old nature begin to turn in them. Look how important it was as a pastor that he says in that verse number 12 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, we pleaded with you, encouraged you, and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. For he called you to share in his kingdom and glory. Let me read that again because it's so important. Listen to what's happening from this pastor's heart. And, and I want us to do an examination of the church as we know it today. Uh, you understand something. Here's the Apostle Paul and he has a relationship with these people. He's looking them in the eye and he says, We pleaded with you. We encouraged you and urged you to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy for he called you to share in his kingdom and glory see this is a picture of the new testament church it's the persistence to understand i've got to get you on track because i need you to stay on track see i, I believe this if you start off on the wrong track you're going to have a hard time getting back on the right track somebody say amen so if somewhere along the way that you believe Christianity is just about you, 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 you got started on the wrong track. Because Colossians tells us that we were created by him and for him. It doesn't say we were created for ourselves and by ourselves and in ourselves. In myself, I have my being, you know, and I exist and I am. That's not the word of God. And so what we need to understand today is this. The church is not perfect. Somebody say amen. amen. This church is not perfect. And over the years, there have been churches and men that recruited people simply for their kingdom. But I want you to understand, God will hold those people responsible. But that doesn't preclude or exclude you out of what God's going to hold you responsible for. Somebody say Amen. Yeah, there, there are some people and we find ourselves trying to put the asterisk on our life and saying, that pastor really screwed up my life. Can I tell you something? He may have been everything that you're saying he is, but it doesn't exclude you out of the kingdom of God. Because Jesus died on a cross for you and you're using this man as an example and saying he's greater than Jesus. 
And what's happened over the years, and we see this in America, we have created spectator churches. But we're by and large, we cater to people being just nothing more than spectators. We're not asking you to be a participant. We don't, we understand, hey, your life is busy. We understand, hey, this, we understand that. Just come and be a spectator and give your money. And that's not the New Testament church. And we've done people a disservice by not letting them know you're a participant in the body of Christ. In fact, the word of God says it's made up of many parts and you are a part of that. That means you're a part of the body. And so when we understand that, I had a guy tell me yesterday, this is crazy. I mean... I acted, how many, of you, how many of you try to put on a face like you're not shocked when somebody's telling you something? <laughs> I went in to, to get something I needed to pick up. And, and this guy is, I know because he's told me many times, he is a friend of a, of a guy that pastors one of the largest churches in America. I mean, it's kind of his calling card with me. You know, I went to school with this guy and I know him. Hey, all right, cool, you know. Well, he said another preacher found out about that in this area and called him and said, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? Can you call this preacher? Uh, because I'm doing the series he's doing. I'm watching the DVDs and I'm preaching it on Sunday and he skipped a couple of weeks and I need, I need his notes. <laughs> and I know he was telling me this to impress me. And I had to walk out of there really fast because I thought, you know, the New Testament is made up of different letters to different churches and none of the letters are the same. And here we are in America being a copycat church thinking that we can preach somebody else's message to our congregation and it's okay. Listen to me, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to quit the day the Holy Ghost quits speaking to me. Somebody say amen. Amen. I mean, we ought to get fresh manna for people right here in LaPorte, Texas at Life Community Church and not what's coming down from any place else, Dallas or Oklahoma City or wherever it's coming from. Somebody say amen. amen. He say, you just got on, you got, yeah, I did. I'm, I'm past it now though. <laughs> okay. You get the picture that God's called you not to be a spectator, but to be a participant. And it's all about your spiritual formation and course. And, and I came across this passage last night. This one scripture. I, Walter, I know this happens to you. I, I've read the New Testament. I can't tell you. My, I've got Bibles that are marked up from one side to the other. And there's a passage that we've all read a million times. And I got to the next verse and I said, I have never seen that before. It's like, where, where have I been? It's a passage everybody here. If you've gone to church any number of days, you're all familiar with it. It's Philippians 3. Start in verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. How many of you know this scripture? Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race. He's a participant. I press on to reach the end of the race. He's not a spectator. That's not my point, but that was a good one. And receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. Look at verse 16. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Indicating this. That you can make progress spiritually and digress. How many of you see that? Yeah. You, you can make progress spiritually. You say, well, pastor, I remember when I first got saved, man, I served the church. I sacrificed. I did everything I could. But now I'm a mature Christian. Now you're a spectator. Come on now. You say, pastor, that's harsh. Hold on just a second. <laughs> Let's read that again. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Man. 
there's some things that I don't want to have to go through again. Somebody say amen. There's some tests I don't want to have to take again. I, I think it's important that we hold on to the progress that we've already made. I, I think it's important that we go back and we say, you know what? That's where I got off track. How I many you know it's important to know where you got off track? Recently, we went to Disney World. And we were there. And they changed some things around. Believe it or not. Since the last time. And I said, we need to go this way to go there. And we tried to go there that way. And we couldn't go that way. And it wasn't there. And so we had to look on one of those maps. And the map was there. And it says, you are here. I was thankful. You know why? Because you can't know where you're going to. You first and foremost know where you're at. And some of you need the Holy Spirit to speak to you today and say, you know what? You made the progress to here. Remember when. It's more than just being sentimental. It's more than just when your relationship was hot with God. There's progress that we make. And it's not progress that's all about us. Because you remember when you were making progress? People in your neighborhood begin changing with you. People in your family begin changing with you. People begin to say, see you and say, hey, can I go to church with you? You didn't even have to ask them. Somebody say amen. But you know what? Very few people ask to go to be with a spectator. You know why? Because it's just another event. You can go to the movies. You can go see Avengers Endgame. Come on now. I'm going tomorrow. Don't tell me anything. Me and Jonathan have been looking forward to this for... We bore the girls at the table because we have been speculating about how this is going to turn out. And he's already told me he's right. Just letting you know. See, you don't, we don't outgrow becoming like Jesus. Let me tell you a story. Today, as you came here and you're a first-time guest or a second-time guest, you turned that card in. Here's the cool thing. We're going to send you a Chick-fil-A gift card. Isn't that cool? That's very cool. But the bad news is you can't go today. <laughs> They're closed on Sunday. You say, that's all because of their founder, Truett Cathy. It's true. He was a devoted Christian. Uh, and he believed that his business, no matter what people told him and how much money they said he could make, he was dedicated more to his godly principles and his progress than he was the almighty dollar. But let me tell you something about Truett Cathy that you may not know, and this is about choosing selflessness and humility. Did you know that for almost 60 years, I said 60 years, he died at 93, for almost 60 years, Truett Cathy taught an 8th grade boys Sunday school class. Now, of all the jobs in the church, I might consider that one. 8th <laughs> grade boys. Their attention span is this because they're thinking about things we can't talk about in church that it's like this. 8th <laughs> grade boys. 60 years, a billionaire that could have chosen to do anything in the church. There in Jonesboro, at Jonesboro Baptist Church, he could have done anything there he wanted to do. But for 60 years, he taught 8th grade boys. People say, well, I'd like for God to prosper me like Truett Cathy. Well, go ahead and teach eighth grade boys for about 60 years and let's see what happens. <laughs> see if you can do it for a year. Come on now. He had determined the formation of who he was and said, this is, this is my choice. That in spite of who I become or people think that I am, this is what God has called me to do. Because you know what he believed? Eighth grade boys were the place where it was at because they were becoming men at that age. And he had an opportunity in their formation to make them men of God. 60 years. We talk about it around here. And if you've not been here often, I'll tell you what we talk about. 
We say there are two kinds of people when they come to the body of Christ. There's ice people and there's chicken people. Now you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, how many of you have ever had a family reunion? And you have family members that you wouldn't trust the fried chicken with. Because <laughs> they may or may not show up. If they do show up, they're going to show up late. And if they do show up late, they're going to show up with the wrong kind of chicken. Baked chicken, not fried chicken. <laughs> that'll, get, that'll get you every time. You're expecting Popeyes and they bring out some stinking baked chicken. <laughs> so you know what? There's some people you can't trust to bring the chicken. They haven't proven themselves. So you know what you do? You say, just bring some ice. You already know you've got the ice covered and it's no big deal. And there's some people that are ice people in the kingdom and some people that are chicken people. Which are you? You see, in our formation of Christ, you understand Stuart Cathy, he was bringing home the roast beef. He was bringing home the prime rib. 60 years of teaching 8th grade boys. And we think this is all about me. Church is all about me. Well, I don't like the preacher, and I don't like the carpet, and I didn't like that song he sang, and I don't like who's coordinating the nursery now, and I don't like this. I don't like. Can I tell you something? It's not about you. That's a spectator attitude. You're a participant. Get in the game. We're all in it together. Let's get in the game and let's win together. Let's quit fighting each other and allowing spectators to determine who the church is supposed to be. It's not, about, it's not a spectator sport. It's all about participants here. You say, Pastor, you must be going to take another offering. I'm not. When are you going to pass out the volunteer forms? I'm not. This is not about any of that. I'm not self-serving this today. I'm telling you, this is about spiritual formation because selflessness and humility are practices. And if you don't learn to practice in an eighth grade boys Sunday school class, can I tell you something? You'll never learn to practice it anyplace else. I guarantee you there were days he wanted to quit. He said, I don't want to do that. They're no fun. These kids, they're belligerent. They're disrespectful. But you know what? 60 years... Because he discovered the principle, it's not about me. See, I used to have a pastor friend of mine. He would always say, as you get older, you're either going to get bitter or you're going to get better. I found that to be true. Kind of remind me of the story of these two elderly gentlemen. They're sitting there in the nursing home. They go outside on a beautiful day. They're sitting underneath the tree and one says to the other, Slim, I'm 83 years old now. I'm just full of angst and pains. Hey, Slim, I know you're about my age. How do you feel? Slim says, I feel like a newborn baby. Really, Slim, a newborn baby? Yep, Slim says, no hair, no teeth, and I think I just wet my pants. We understand we can't back up. I can't back up. You get to hold the progress. You understand something. If you said, hey, I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going to be dedicated and I'm going to come to church, don't get thrown off by that. There's always going to be a challenge. Somebody say amen. It's in everything. But here's the difference in what we do. We're serving a real and risen Savior and Lord. It's not like the coaches on Jonathan's team that call me and they're upset with the lack of participation from these kids on the baseball team that they're not dedicated enough. You understand? They're not dedicated to baseball. They're going to outgrow it. They're going to forget about it. It's okay. They're going to go play Fortnite. They'd rather play Fortnite than play baseball. <laughs> We're talking about Jesus here. I'm not talking about a program. I'm not talking about filling a place in the nursery. I'm talking about a practice. The practice in our life is the choice of humility and selflessness. And you understand the practice comes in. We have to put it before us to say, okay, God, every day I need to be like this. This is prayer. And that was my first point. You know, the practice that has to be established first and foremost in our life to get where it is prayer. 
prayer. You can't just say, oh, well, I'm going to be what I am. Lord, forgive me. You know what? You're going to come to church and you're going to be miserable because you're going to come here and the devil's going to beat you over the head and with such condemnation to say, you know what? What are you doing here today? Why are you raising your hand? How, how can you? You're, you are such a hypocrite. And you can convince yourself however you want to convince yourself. But you've got to come back to a place to say, you know what? I'm going to make my life a life of prayer. How does it start every day? Pray this prayer. Lord, today, I want to put in practice selflessness and humility. And I can't do that without you. Now you're putting something into play. Something that says, okay, no matter what happens here, I shared it on Wednesday night. For years, I went to Happy Harbor Retirement Apartments and I did a Bible study. And I would show up there after having two services, three services packed full of people. And I'd go there and there'd be one person show up. And I remember one week I said, you know what, I'm done. This isn't worth my time or effort. And I'll never forget, I got a whooping from the Holy Ghost. Did anybody ever get a whooping from the Holy Ghost? I mean, he whooped my butt because you know what he said? This is the practice of humility. And you're going to come. It doesn't matter who shows up. You're going to come and serve because this is about you and it's not about anything else. You make, the, you make that choice of humility and you come and serve these people and do it with all your might because it's about Jesus. And so you know what? I went there joyfully and I said, it doesn't matter if one shows up or 10 shows up. I, I'm gonna do what you told me to do. Because we've made it all about the results. But I'm gonna tell you something. One person can make a difference. Just one. Unfortunately, I don't do it anymore because most of those folks have all died off. The good news is they all went to be with Jesus. Somebody say amen. They all went to be with Jesus. And it was just because after 20 years of doing it, I didn't give up. So number one is prayer. Number two is you have to read your word. <laughs> we get so discombobulated you, you, how many, I ask a question. I, I know that people, this is the advisement. How many of you get your car aligned regularly? Can I see your hands? We want to give you applause if you do that, please. <laughs> Walter, get, I, knew you, I knew you were right there. Anybody else, you get your, your, get your car aligned regularly. Okay, what that says about the rest of us, this is normal. So you take it to the tire guy and he says, you know what? You wouldn't have to buy tires every three months if you get your car aligned. Don't, it's okay, just put them on there. <laughs> and we're driving down the road with the cockeyed like this because we got to keep it straight. This is the new straight. <laughs> the word of God keeps you in alignment. Yes. See, we have enough dysfunction in our life. Come on now. And we need alignment. Uh, otherwise, we're going to try to make this thing work. Uh, and we're going we're to be moving into other people's lanes all the time. You know what happens when you don't stay in the word and stay aligned? You move in somebody else's lane. You know what happens when you move in somebody else's lane? You get in a wreck. I'm trying to help you today. How many of you know that we need to read the word? People say, I just don't like reading. Oh. I didn't say you had to read the whole thing at one setting. <coughs> but you do need to read it. You know, there have been some days that I, re I, read, I read down and I keep reading. I come across one verse and I'll have to read that verse for three days. You say, you read one verse for three days. I do. And I'm just taking it in. Okay, that's true. Yeah, that's for me. Because the Bible says that we are to be salt and light. It didn't say just light. It says be salt and light. And what that meant in Jesus' day is that is something that's beneficial to others. Can I tell you something? If you're a spectator and not a participant, you won't be selfless and, and full of humility. Because when you are salt and light, you bring something to the table. You bring something that's beneficial for others. 
And lastly, we have to commit to faithfulness. Shelly's dad died eight years ago, nine now. Eight, eight years ago. My dad died a month ago or four weeks ago. And I couldn't have had two better examples of faithfulness. Walter knows this. He served with, on the board with them. I mean, two guys that were so faithful. But they just weren't faithful in, the, in being faithful. They were faithful in understanding that this Christian life requires hard work. It requires sacrifice. They were exemplary in their faithfulness and their giving. I mean, just incredible in, in their attendance and their service and everything that they did. They understood this is what it takes to stay on course and not move backward because we're moving somewhere. Because you understand something, there ain't no grave that's going to keep this body down. Come on now. He rose and I plan on rising too. And the word of God says that on that day when we see him, we should have lived in such a way that we don't shy away because of our own condemnation. See, it's going to happen for all of us. This is a pastoral message. This is the precursor. This is the warning for everybody here to say, you understand something. We're all going to meet him. And we have the choice to stay on course, to live like him, to come and say, you know what? I'm going to live a life with the same attitude that Christ had, selfless and humble. You know what the word of God says? Here's the amazing part of Philippians chapter 2. It says that God exalted him to a place of preeminence. That every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Can I tell you something? Listen to what I'm about to tell you. If you'll live selflessly for Christ and not out for yourself, God will raise you up to a place one day of preeminence with Jesus Christ. It already says we're seated together with him in heavenly places. And we just have to walk in that place with him today. Will you bow your heads with me? Let's be honest today. It's a good place to be in the house of God. How many of you here today and you just realize you've gotten off course? And you say, Pastor, I want to get back on course today. If that's you, will you raise your hand right now and just be honest. Say, I've gotten off course. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, lots of hands. Thank you. Can we pray right now before we pray with those that are come to Jesus? Lord, we come this morning. It's so easy to get off course because, Lord, the way of the world is complaining about everything. And everybody's a spectator. Everybody's on the sidelines and they are critiquing everything. And we've done that with you. That's not what we want to do, Lord. We want to get back in the game. <laughs> we want to put our jersey on. We want to get in shape spiritually. So, Lord, we're committing ourselves to prayer and to your word. We're committing ourselves to faithfulness today. We're committing ourselves to you because that's what that means. You are the head of the body and we are a part of your body. We're on your team. You're not on ours. We're on your team today. And we choose to be on your team. So speak to us today. Show us where to start again. I know, Lord, that you can give the specifics where I can. Show people right where to start today. Where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. And they know, and Lord, they will serve you joyfully. Amen and amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, if I were to die today, I have no idea where I would spend eternity. That's the simplicity of it. If that's you today and you say, I want to know. And I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. If that's you, will you raise your hand today? I want to pray with you as well. Raise your hand right where you're at. Lord bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
lots of hands again. Can, can, can we all pray this prayer and pray it sincerely? And, and those of you who raise your hand, please pray this prayer out loud because there's going to be people next to you praying it as well. Let's just pray it from our heart. You know why? Because God can hear you. Lord Jesus, come on, let's pray it. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart and change me. Change everything about me. I'm giving it all to you. I'm withholding no good thing because you withhold no good thing from me. Forgive me of my sins and replace them with your peace, with your love, with your joy, and with your spirit. Amen. Stand with me. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been a great weekend to be in the house of the Lord today, amen? Wonderful weather. How many of you are going to be salt and light today? Amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed.